Hi. Hi, John. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. You um, are not coming across clear at all. You sound like a Xylon warrior from Battlestar Galactic. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Any better? Yeah, the, the headphones, you'd think that they would actually work better because, you know, you had mentioned that and I've tried them before, but they, yeah, I end up sounding like some alien or something. So no headphones. Yeah, and it was, hi, John. <laughs> I'm still here. My camera does that on occasion. It just, I don't know why it does that. My camera is my phone. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so it, it just does that. Okay, good. All right. So I got your message. We've got two hours. <laughs> yeah, about. It's okay if it's a, a little bit over, but um, yeah. And it, and just a warning, I have a kitten and a dog here. And so if they start to get crazy, I'm going to take a 30 second break and put them in the back bedroom. But right now they're yeah. calm and sleepy. Yeah, so. that's funny. I just had a the last person I was talking to just before you on Zoom. They had a dog, a cat, and a cockatiel who was oh, sitting wow. on the shoulder and flying around and causing all sorts of mayhem. <laughs> it was probably one of the best Zoom calls I've had. And um, then while I was waiting um, for you, I had a cat thing myself. One my one of our cats got into the crawl space in the attic so I could hear him in the walls. And I was like, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> so I had to go and do that. So, yeah, it must be, cool. I don't know. If I knew more about astrology, I'd probably be able to go, oh, that's to do with the fourth phase of the lunar yeah. ascendancy. Oh, oh, what's his, is that a, a, is that a boy or a girl? It's a boy. His name is Hieronymus or Hero. Hieronymus. Oh, very good. Yep. Yeah. He's very curious in your voice. He's, yeah, showing interest. But can anyways, probably animals. You can probably sense the menagerie here as well as there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so. That, that's a great name for a cat, Hieronymus, because like cats are scary <laughs> in, the, in the way that they just. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Devour things in a very I'm... psychopathic way. <laughs> Absolutely. They're, they're, they're. Yeah, crazy that way one minute and then the next they're just cuddly, sleepy little creatures. Animals yeah. are just wonderful. We have two cats and a dog and um, it's wild. We have a small house, but it's it's wild and it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, we've got two cats, two dogs, three donkeys and uh, 30 sheep. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that sounds That sounds great. Yeah. Okay, now if you're listening, this is an Animal Corner. I am talking to uh, the Animal Corner podcast. This is I'm talking to uh, Aaliyah Chapin in Seattle. Did I pronounce your name correctly, yeah. Aaliyah? Yeah. You okay. Did. Are you related to Harry Chapin? Um, I'm not, but interestingly, my grandfather's name is Harry, but that's on my mom's side, and my my dad's side is the Chapin. So, no, I'm not, but I have both those names in my family. Ah, okay. And I'm guessing I'm the first person that's ever asked you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Now, if you don't know who Harry Chapin is, um, he was sort of in the 70s, late 70s, early 70s. Cats in the Cradle, that's just two hits. And then pertinent to this conversation, All Flowers Are Red. It's a great song if you haven't heard it. I'm assuming you've heard them, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Not not super you, familiar, but you play them every year at Christmas, I imagine. Just of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now for someone uh, listening who hasn't seen your work, Aliyah, how would you describe your paintings? Oh, um I know I've been doing this long enough, I should be able to describe it. I think part of my struggle is that the work has just gone through a big change, but I would say um it's figurative realism. Um large scale mostly, although some work is very small. Um, I paint plants and people, um, you know, it's, I, that's basically it, but that also so does not describe it. Um, <laughs> I'm terrible at these <laughs> elevator speeches. Uh, how, how would you describe it? Can you describe it? <laughs> yeah, what you said. Um, yeah, what you said. Now, uh, figurative realism, yeah, definitely. Plants, um, scenery, uh, I think uh, whether you aim to or not, you sort of paint the essence of the person. You seem to capture that really well. Um, and there is very little idealization of 
anything. So you get the beauty of the um, scenery, the landscape, and you get the beauty of the person, but you can see their scars. You can see this um, where they are sagging, where they're not sagging. You can sort of see them radiating as well. How's that? That sound about right? Uh, what you said, that sounds amazing. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> okay, somewhere between what both of us said. Um, I forgot to mention, just to give you time context for our conversation, today is Wednesday, the 8th of December, 2021. Now, I'm kind of, I'm charging along here in the questions because I'm conscious of time. I want to give you as much time to answer everything. Uh, we've Because we've had lots of questions come in on social media. So yeah, I'm just going to dive, dive into them. Uh, Joan San Filippo McDowell in Texas says, "What training did you have, or are you self-taught?" Love the gentle spirit that your work portrays. Oh, thank you, thank you, Joan. Um, I'm not self-taught. I mean, I've taught myself things. I think really, you go to school and teachers teach you things. Your fellow students teach you things, but you also just teach yourself things. But uh, no, I, I went to um, Cornish College of the Arts for my undergraduate here in Seattle. And then I moved to New York and went to the New York Academy of Art for graduate school. And then I've also taken some workshops at Gage Academy in Seattle, Studio Escalier in Paris. Um, and that's it. So yeah, definitely been very much into the training. And actually in high school, I started studying with a local artist, a local painter, a landscape painter, because I really wanted to learn how to paint with oils and my mom is an artist as well, but she um, didn't know how to paint with oils. And so she was wonderful and found found someone who would allow me to come to a studio once a week and paint. So yeah, I've definitely really um, done a lot of a lot of training, which recently I've been um, trying to undo a little bit of that. I absolutely love training. I, lo I love it. But but there's a point where you want to go backwards. So yeah. And what was, was the thing in Germany, was that, was that a residency? Um, yeah, in Leipzig, Germany. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I did a residency in Leipzig. Yeah. That was um, part of, part of my graduate school. Um, it was through the school. It was between my first and second years. And that was absolutely amazing. That was a really incredible experience. Yeah. And just let everyone know what your mom's name is so that they can go and look her up okay. if they want to. Yeah. Deborah Koff Chapin. So it's D-E-B-O-R-A-H. And then K O F F dash C H A P I N. So yeah, yeah. she's a wonderful artist, and definitely yep. check her out on yep. on on all the things. And Thank you. She's not related to Harry Chapin either, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but she does this great thing called I think it's called touch painting. Is it? Or have I got the name touch of it drawing. right? Touch drawing. Yeah. Touch yeah, drawing. Yeah. 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 So that's very interesting. It's kind of a mix of painting and it's very therapeutic as well from what I could see. It's very interesting. Yeah, she travels around the world and teaches and she has um, decks of cards called soul cards that have been in print for 30, no, 25 years, 26 years, long time. So yeah, she's she's been an inspiration. It's been great to see that it's possible to be an artist. I think growing up, I was able to see that. I was one of those lucky kids who was actually able to see that you could grow up and be an artist um, from a very young age. And yeah, I really appreciate that and all the support that that I had from her because I'm definitely aware that not everyone had that. Yeah, lovely. And your dad's an architect, is that right? He is, yes, you've done your research. Yeah, he's he's an architect. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't do research anymore, but I just happened to <laughs> come across that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's an amazing architect and so also very creative. Yeah, lovely. Now, just to put your sensibilities in context for someone who's listening, who are your creative heroes and are they all artists? Oh, um, interesting question. Are they all artists? I mean, I don't think they're all artists because I immediately just think of nature um, because it's, inc I mean, that is incredible. I mean, yeah, I remember always, great. you know, being being interested in um, or feeling like when I was really, really just obsessed with realism, um, feeling like that was the most creative, like nature is so creative. Why would you try to do anything else besides just like to, to, to explore what nature can do? Um, so nature. <laughs> yeah. Jenny Savile. That, that, that's a great point because really artists probably through the ages 
have had the same dilemma that everybody has now who has a phone or anyone who thinks like this, because I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you see a beautiful sunset and you're going, oh, this is so fantastic. This is beautiful. Yeah. And then it comes into your mind, I should maybe take a picture of this. And then it's like, you know, and that moment of sometimes it can last for longer than a moment of do I just enjoy it or do I try and capture it? You know, and like artists have probably been, have, you know, through the ages of like, wow, this is a fantastic sunset. Do I sketch this or do I just enjoy it? You know? Yeah, exactly. No, I think I think that that's that's really it. And just trying to capture nature. Um, I mean, I think I'm still trying to do that just in a different a different way that's less the visual world but um you know what we can see but yeah i mean i think i think nature is probably my biggest inspiration yeah for sure beautiful yeah um okay so you said jenny savile yeah jenny savile absolutely love her um she's been a huge inspiration her work and just who she is as an artist and um a person and um agnes pelton is actually a, a recent artist i'm not she's not super well known um she has I think she was more well known for her like or not well known but she was more known for her um kind of realist paintings but then she ended up doing all of these incredible um paintings that were very spiritual and very like kind of desert transcendentalists and it just really really incredible work and um she's been a big inspiration recently yeah and there's like a billion others that uh, I mean artists are just I can be inspired by so many different types of art. It really depends on my mood and the day and kind of yep. where I'm at. But. Yeah. I've heard you mention Ron Muick a few times. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, I haven't thought about him for a while, but um, absolutely. He, I saw a show of his in London and had never heard of his work before and, and just walked into this museum and was just completely blown away by these huge lifelike sculptures. Yeah. Um, and the human quality of, of him, you know, of his, of his work. I mean, it's, it's so unrealistic because it's, the scale is so different and yet it's so completely real and human because of its, you know, complete, complete realism and, 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 you know, also just how he depicts, um, depicts people. He's not glorifying them. You know, they're, he's not glorifying their, their postures, their facial expressions, anything. It's just very, um, yeah, just very real. I wish I had a better yeah. word than that. But. Yeah. I was delighted when I saw you talking about him because I thought I was the only person who knew about him. <laughs> <laughs> More people um, should know about him. Yeah, yeah. because I, I saw his, he had a, I'd say it was a, wasn't double life size, but it was like one and a half times life size um, statue of a, a pregnant woman. And she just had her hands on her head and she just looked really, tired from being pregnant and yeah. so she was like for me she was like a giant because she was you know uh, like a whole half another body higher than me and uh, I saw that in Brisbane years ago and I could it was so, so remarkable to just stand in front of it I you know you have that feeling of like any minute she's going to wipe her nose or scratch herself it's so lifelike and yet so unlifelike because so big wild yeah exactly exactly yeah that's so cool I love, I love that you know his work as well. Yeah, he's brilliant. Okay, Francesca Frue on Instagram says, Hi, thank you very much for your work. I love your podcasts. You're very welcome, Francesca. Aaliyah, I'd, love, I'd like to know how you choose a subject to paint. For me, it's difficult. One day I want to paint a landscape. Another day it's a human figure. The next day it's abstract painting. Do you struggle with that? Has this been a difficult for you, a difficulty for you in the past? Um, that's a great question, Francesca. Um, so in the past, yeah, that's, that's definitely been difficult for me. I remember, um, in school, actually just before in graduate school, actually just before I started the aunties project, which then kind of launched my career. Um, I was really struggling with that. I just didn't know. I felt like, okay. So I felt like I wanted to make these big, important paintings that would say these really important big things and basically save save the world through art somehow with each painting and that kind of pressure was just ridiculous and um it ended up that I made really contrived paintings and I just every single painting felt like a struggle it's just like okay what do I paint next what do I paint next and so I kind of had a little bit of a crisis and fell apart and then realized I'm just gonna paint what I know and I'm gonna ask my mom and her friends if they'll pose for me and that was really helpful because it it helped it helped solve that problem of what do I paint um 
It did help though that I was, I knew that I wanted to paint people. I actually used to not be interested in anything else and like naked people. I wasn't even interested in clothing, um, just, just people, um, skin and bodies. And so I just followed, I just followed that. And I think, I don't know. So it, so it has been a challenge for me and it also hasn't because I've had this obsession. Um, and now, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it still is a challenge. Like, I don't know what I'm going to paint next, but I feel like I've learned to trust that I'll figure it out. I've just learned that if I quiet down enough and give it time, something will show up. And if I just keep following that, you know, that, that thing that I'm interested in, it's, it's like this internal kind of body knowing that I'm, I just sort of click into and it's like, yes, that's what I want to paint. And the longer I've kind of, uh, the more relationship I've built with that internal something in me, um, the more confidence I have. And that doesn't mean I know what I'm going to paint next. I don't know what my next painting is going to be right now, but I trust that it's going to be there. So yeah, it's still challenging. And yet I, I don't really struggle with the challenge. I just trust it. Yeah. Brilliant. I hope hard, that helps. Yeah. Hard to <laughs> develop that trust. I'm guessing. Oh yeah. It's, it's still hard. I mean, but that's part of it is just knowing that it's hard and, and it's really just, just time. I think just knowing through experience, like I'll figure it out. I've been here before many times. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable. Exactly. Oh yeah. Oof. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so how do you, how does the idea for a painting start for you then? Like, do you, how do you record, you know, are you a sketchbook person? Do you record your ideas on little thumbnails or do you write things down or voice memos? What sort of things do you do? Um, none of those things. Um, I, you know, I wish I'd always wish, wish that I was a sketchbook person, but I haven't been. Um, so I kind of have two answers. So the work is the work that I did before COVID and the work that I'm doing now after COVID or I guess during COVID, but after COVID became part of our lives. Um, so before what I would do is, is photo shoots. I would, I would take my camera and a group of, a group of people quite often, the aunties, my mom, and her friends, and I would just take like 700 photographs of them outside. Um, and I'd guide them a little bit, but really I was trying to create a space for them to do whatever they felt like doing and just capturing that. So I would, that was sort of my way of sketching. And then, and then I would look through all those photographs and just figure out what it is that like grabs me. It was just, um, something, something would just grab at me and, and, and say that it wanted to be painted. And then I would play with that image, um, quite often in Photoshop and just play around with different, different compositions and, uh, various, yeah, various compositions until it felt right. Um, but now, um, my work comes from a completely different place. It comes from these very intuitive sketches that I'm, I'm really trying to get away from all my training. And I'm, I, I'm going to my studio and, and I meditate and then I take some paint and some paper that I've gessoed and use my left hand, which is my non-dominant hand. And, um, intuitively just try to try to make images and just see what, see what, see what comes. It might be a little bit of an image in my head. It might be more of a feeling in my body. And I'm just playing with it and I might make 20, 30, you know, drawings and, and then I'm looking through those drawings. So I guess before it was photographs, just gathering photographs. Now it's gathering these more internal drawings and kind of going from there. And then I'm building up and taking, taking photographs of myself and maybe we'll get more into the process of that, but it's, it's a whole, whole different process now than it used to be. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. There's lots of questions about all that. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you that now. Um, Vicky Sullivan on Patreon. Thanks for the tea. Vicky says, thanks John for the great podcast and hi Aaliyah. I love your work. I was wondering if you take photos of your models on site in your outdoor paintings, or do you get the model to pose and then paint them into the background? Um, what's your advice to make them fit into the background if you t take the photos separately? Do you use Photoshop to stitch them or prints? Um, I'd love to hear any tips as it's not easy to get models to pose on site. Um, thanks, Vicky. Yeah, um, great questions there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, 
for me it's actually a combination of things so i've done i've i've taken photographs of my models outside and then i've painted them in the place that they are um the last droplets of the day is one of those it's a large multi-figure piece and i decided to just paint them exactly where they were which i didn't don't often do actually um so i always photograph my models outside or i shouldn't say always i most of the time as often as possible photograph them outside actually because of the lighting that's a huge part i like just natural outdoor light um but what i've started to do is or not started to do i've actually been doing this for for quite a while but i'm also always gathering photographs as i travel or I go hiking or camping or whatever i'm just i'm just taking photographs so it might be the mountains it might be um just some sky you know i'm taking a walk and i look up at the sky and i'll take a, take a photograph of it um and i think right then i am using photoshop for sure photoshop is great um i'm not very good at it but that's okay because i'm turning them into paintings so all of my terrible photoshop skills don't really matter um so i'm sketching them to you know uh putting them together in photoshop playing with the color a little bit but i don't have the skills to really make it look at all real and again that's not my intention in in photoshop uh so what i do is honestly just in the painting itself often i will well i'll, I'll kind of figure out what the lighting is going to be and let's just say that the sky is pink there's going to be some of that pink that's going to come into the bodies and as soon as you do that like you kind of just imagine as soon as you do that like you imagine where that where that pink sky might fall on these bodies it it makes it feel like they're actually in the space and then there's a lot of like working where where the feet touch the ground um you know you can actually invent a lot you can get away with a lot i think um it definitely takes practice and just kind of trial and error and figuring figuring it out but i think a lot of it is about the lighting and making sure that whatever kind of lighting you have in your environment is it warm is it cool um you know how intense is it and what general direction is it falling on there on the bodies and what color is falling in the body so like if you have a pink sky but your 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 lights in your bodies are are you know blue or green that's not going to really make sense but if they're if they're pink yeah that kind of makes sense so you can get away with a lot um in graduate school i took um a painting from imagination class from jean-pierre roy uh everyone probably knows him or you should he's fantastic and that class i have to say i was so scared to take that class probably the the class I was most scared to take, painting from imagination. Um, but Why? it taught me so much, taught me so much. Why? Yeah. Oh, uh, because since I was a little kid, I've been obsessed with realism and wanting to have a reference, just whether it was, whether it was life or a photograph, having a reference was really important to me. And so that's the muscle I had really worked and I had not worked at all the imagination not at all when i was really young i did but for many years i hadn't worked the imagination muscle and it taught me that class taught me to to just trust that imagination muscle and it completely opened up my world nice. he's the big he's the he's a very big man isn't he with the big beard is, am i got the right yes. guy yes yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, he's great yeah yeah he's he's really great um so i recommend everyone try to paint from your imagination and just figure things out and just also just studying life and actually thinking about it like when you're outside and looking at looking at a tree and looking at the light like I'm looking outside at the, the trees outside and I see the light and I'm seeing how it's falling and just paying attention to life and the more you consciously pay attention to it the more you can start to understand how it works and then bring it into the paintings and then yeah you can actually get away with a lot it might not actually be accurate but there's there's ways that you can somehow convince people that it is accurate, even though it's probably totally not. Um, and I think that's part of the magic of painting. Yeah, lovely. Chasley Joanna in Canada says, you are my all time favorite artist. Your lighting, your subject matter, it's also moving. My questions are, um, where do you find references for your landscapes slash backgrounds? 
Uh, do you photograph the subject within the landscape? If it's two separate references, how, how do you match so perfectly the lighting of the background landscape to the models? Thank you so much. P.S. John, thank you for this podcast. I've been listening for uh, a good few years now, and it always keeps me company. You're welcome. Now, we've had that's happened, that'll happen a few times where we'll get a kind of almost a double up of questions. So if you feel like, yeah, I kind of covered that, that's fine. You can just say, yeah. That's I've covered it, but if sometimes these these questions they be f- phrased slightly differently and they can tr- bring out something else in you, so you have two, um, two options there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like I kind of answered. I feel like I kind of answered it. Um, yeah, I mean, just photographing everywhere I go. Um, you know, whenever I'm traveling, I'm I'm taking my camera. Um, yeah, and then the photo, the fo- what I answered with the Photoshop thing. I think I think I've answered that. But what what was their name again? The person chasley yeah, chasley chasley i want to thank you for the compliment that was that was very kind of you to say chasley thank you yeah um and i hope i answered your question before with the previous with the previous question yeah john I is there I anything think... that you feel like i want to i should dive into more with that is there any no no i think you got it i think you covered it yeah yeah i think the main kind of the things i took away from it anyway was that uh, to get them to sit down if you happen to be combining to get them to sit down is to make sure the reflected light is correct. The color yeah. is the right thing yeah. you know? and shadows under feet and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so. I'm, you said a lot more than that. I'm just paraphrasing. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you do color studies or value studies before you start the big picture? Um, I have very occasionally done color studies, not value studies, but um, very occasionally done color studies. So I did a gigantic triptych, um, called our shouts for drowned in stars or something like that (laughs) um largest painting i've ever done and and i i knew i wanted to do some sort of study for that so i did a small study for that um which was great because then i could give it to my parents and that was nice to be able to give them something um yeah and but you know i'm i most of the time don't do color studies but with my newer work i've started to do a little bit but what i mean by color study is that i'm making swatches of paint just to see which colors I want to use. It's not okay. at all the painting. Um, it's really just what blue do I want to use? What, you know, what yellow looks good with that blue or yeah. what kind of paint do I want to use? How do I want to, do I want to make this pink from, from different colors? Do I want to, um, you know, use direct from the tube? Like what, what colors do I want to use? But really just little, like I've, you know, some blank canvases around lying around my studio that just have little paint swatches on them. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've, so I've, you know, talked, talked about not doing sketches really and, and not doing color studies. And for me like that, those have all just felt um, kind of tedious and I want to throw everything I have into the painting. And I feel like yeah. when I've done, when I've put a lot of that, like fresh new energy. So like when, when I first get an idea and it, there's just like, this excitement and this energy that I want to harness and take into the painting. And I've found that if I put in into the color studies or into some other study, then by the time I get to the painting, I'm just kind of replicating. I'm just sort of a machine. And so I want the painting to have that fresh energy of discovery. And I also find that there's so many accidents that happen or struggles that happen in the painting process that I mean, that's part of it. And then I can learn new things. Whereas if I'd figured them all out in a study, I wouldn't get that in the painting. And although sometimes it's very annoying and challenging to have that in the large painting, because it's a large painting and that means I have to do something over again. Um, I like what happens when those accidents happen. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Um, That painting that you um, were referencing, the big triptych, that's a that's a nighttime painting, isn't it? It's a painting at night. It is, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, the images. Um, the last person that I was talking to on the podcast was Stephanie Rue, and we had a we had a longish conversation about painting at night, um, and, uh, plein air painting at night, and was it possible? Oh, and how wow. if you couldn't see your palette and all that kind of thing. I mean, but it's funny. It's yeah. a it's a interesting con- conti- continuation. No, I don't know if that's the right word, but anyway, you know, carry over from the last um, conversation I had. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't, I don't paint, I don't paint from from life. I have plenty, but um, 
I, you know, there's no way I could have done that painting from life. It's up in the mountains. It's huge. It's nighttime. I mean, I don't even know how, how someone would paint at night plain air. That sounds. No, we, we, we decided it wasn't possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's even hard to take photographs, good nighttime photographs. It is for sure. I mean, so for the, for that painting, I, I went up, I hiked this, this amazing hike, um, d difficult hike with, with a friend of mine. Um, and we woke up at 3am and took photographs because, because my friend is a really good photographer and knew how to do that. And we got the stars really good, but we couldn't really get the, the, you know, the rocks, like they were too bright. And so I ended up actually just taking daytime photographs and then in Photoshop, darkening and cooling yeah. everything down. So yeah, yeah. technology, you know, you yeah, use well, it. Um, before everyone think got super digital with movies, they used to how they used to shoot day for night, day for night, no night yeah. for day, was they just put a blue um, gel over the camera, and that makes mm -hmm. daylight look like night nighttime. Yeah, I mean, basically, I think that's what what Photoshop would do or does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what substrates do you like to paint on, and why? Um, substrates as in surfaces. Yeah. Like canvas uh, or panel or. Yeah. I, so when I'm working on something small, um, and by small, I mean like a six by six inch or maybe up to 20 by 20 inches. Um, I do panel. I really like panel for, for that. And, and I do, um, a couple layers of acrylic gesso and then, a, and then two layers of oil primer. Um, and that's, yeah, I absolutely love that for smaller, for larger, I do canvas and just, I mean, because of then I don't, it's so much, I mean, having a panel that's like six feet would be, that'd be a lot. Um, so I, yeah, I like to work on just basic cotton duck canvas and I gesso it with probably about like five layers of acrylic gesso sanded down and then two layers of oil primer sanded in between. Right. And, that has to work and you, you haven't, uh, you don't like the aluminium or you, have you tried it or? Oh, you know, I actually haven't, I haven't tried it. Okay. Yeah. But Just when I'll you were saying about be... panels and the big panels, because I yeah. haven't done it either, but apparently you can get the big panels of. Yeah. With the aluminium. Yeah. Um, by, you know, by panel, I mean like wood, you know, wood panels. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. Yeah, but maybe not. But from what from the artists I've talked to who use it, you can get the same kind of like if you like panels, then mm -hmm. you can do it on the aluminium and you can have it as big as you like and it's the same, you know. I wonder if I would actually like it really large because I'm so used to working on canvas mm. really large that there's something about that that I like, but then when canvas is on a smaller scale, I find the weave of the canvas really distracting. Yeah, so right. it really depends on the scale. And my scale goes from, you know, six inches to 18 feet. So it's, it's a pretty big scale difference. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, so when you're starting the main painting, do you um, just start drawing from your reference onto the canvas or how do you get through the drawing stage? Yeah, so I try to do the drawing stage all in one, all in one go because I'm doing it with paint. Um, and so, you know, I have my my Photoshop image that I've cobbled together terribly, um, and I have a basic grid on there, just like usually about one foot by one foot, and I I make the proportions correct so that it matches up with my canvas scale. And um, I use um, a color called Brown Pink by Sennelier. Um, it's this like yellow green, you know, if you've seen any of my process photos, they all, they all have this underpainting color. So that's what I actually use as my drawing. So I'll, I'll, I'll grid it out with paint um, really roughly, just probably about one, one by one foot, just so I can get a basic portion and then, and then just dive in and, 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 and get it on there as much, as much as possible. It's not going to be perfect. Um, I don't need it to be perfect. Um, and then as soon as I have the basic drawing down on there and I said, I'm saying drawing, but I'm painting, I'm using paint. Um, then I'm, I wipe out the grid because I really don't want to paint to a grid. It's more just to make sure that things are in the right proportion. Cause when canvases are so large, it's, it's uh, kind of hard yeah. to always tell. Um, 
yeah. And then, and then I let that dry and then dive in. So how finished is that drawing and is it a sort of grisaille or, or is there a grisaille stage for you? Um, yeah, there's not a grisaille stage. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like basically, you know, it's not even a full value study. I was going to say it is, but it's you quite often. I'm not actually even going that far. Um, yeah. I'm getting like the rough, you know, the rough, like this is where the shadow is and, and this is the light and this is, you know, the contour of the arm and um, <clears throat> this is the texture of the ground, but I'm really just trying to lay something in there. <clears throat> um, so it's not super finished. It's uh, but it's yeah. enough for me to know what I'm doing, but I, yeah. there, you know, I don't want it to actually be extremely finished because I found that if I do that, then I'm going to try to make, and I try to make my, my, subsequent layers of paint match that perfectly and yeah I'm ne it's never it's never going to be accurate enough on that on those beginning layers like every time I come back to the painting I'm I'm getting it more accurate I'm seeing I'm seeing things more and the more realistic it becomes as the painting process goes along and as I get closer to completion um the more inaccuracies I might see so I might need to adjust it so I like to keep the underpainting a little bit open just so that I have room for those adjustments. Yeah. Okay. Um, Vicky Sullivan again on Patreon says, I'd love to know what colors are on your palette. Oh, thank you, Vicky. Okay. So I actually saw that question somewhere and I wrote it down because I would not have remembered. So I'm going to read it out. Is that, does that work? Yeah. Far away. So it isn't always all of these colors, but this is basically it. So um, flake white replacement. Uh, or quick dry white. Those are both by Gamblin. Um, I think they might actually be the same thing, but <laughs> still figuring that out. Uh, brown pink, and this has to be a Sennelier, uh, the brand Sennelier. Yellow ochre, cadmium orange, cadmium red, alizarin and crimson, transparent maroon, which is Windsor Newton, uh, Caput Mortem or Mars Violet, uh, ultramarine blue, indigo blue, Prussian blue, phthalo blue. I love my blues. Thalo green and terra verde. Um, so yeah, those are basically my colors, but it will depend on what painting I'm working on. Um, yeah. But that's that's essentially the palette that I'm using right now. It's it's changed over the years. There's colors that I've had on there that I realize I'm just not using anymore. So they've they've fallen off. And then the other colors like thalo green is a pretty new one for me. I didn't used to use that. Um, right. And blues, I can never have enough blues. Love the blues. <laughs> Um, so no black. Nope. I used to a little bit, but I found it wasn't really using it very much. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm not against then, black. I know some people are against black. I'm not, a, I'm not against it. It just doesn't seem to work in my paintings. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, with all the cadmiums, are you a glove wearing person or not? Uh, I actually use hues. I use cadmium hues. Um, okay. because I am not the cleanest painter. I've gotten better over the years and I wear a glove as much as possible. And I say a glove because I wear one on my left hand because I want to keep my right hand, which is my painting hand. Um, I just, if I have a glove, it's, it, it doesn't work so well. Um, yep. so I, I try to, yeah, I, I try to just use hues and that's why I use the flake white replacement. Um, yeah, again, cause I, I want to live healthy for as long as I can <laughs> um okay Ronnie and hang on Rohini Sen Rohini yeah Hi, I Rohini. hope I got that right Rohini uh yeah, said so I'd you know her yes we uh she went to New York Academy oh okay good all right am I pronouncing her name right uh, I think so Rohini that's your name Rohini. right that's, yeah that's okay. how I <laughs> yeah yeah um I'd love to know how you build up and approach color from choosing a color palette to the technical process that gives you the amazing glow and variety in your surfaces, skin tone and all. Okay, how to describe this. Um, thanks, Rohini, I appreciate that question. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to describe it. It would be easier to show you, but that would take a really long time. We don't, we don't have time and this is a podcast. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm trying to think if it's the older work or newer work because newer work basically I'm exploring a lot more with color so I might have painting that's like really blue or really red or really green um, but let's just 
you know, um, maybe I'll say I'm, I'm working on a painting that's more of a realistic skin tone um, or, you know, day, like daytime. Um, so I am building it up with full color from the very beginning. So I do my Sinelli brown pink underpainting. And nice. again, that's this yellow green color and I'm letting that dry. And then I'm diving in with my full color palette, knowing that it's not at all gonna look accurate at that point. Um, the way that I paint is lots and lots of layers, lots of very thin layers and playing with a lot of opacity and transparency. And so that first layer of color after the underpainting, I'm, I'm laying everything in with the colors that I see, but again, knowing it's not gonna look accurate. Um, it's all gonna be a bit, I try to keep things a bit cooler actually at the beginning. I also just love cool blue paintings. I think it's because I am from the Pacific Northwest perhaps, and it's just the light is just very, very cool out here. Um, so I'm keeping it a little bit cooler because I'm gonna let that dry and then I'm gonna be doing a glaze over that, uh, kind of like a tinted oiling out. Um, and I like those to be a bit warmer because it just feels better. So I'm doing that and then I'm laying in opaque colors. Again, the same, same color palette. Um, opaque colors, kind of floating them in, allowing some of those areas to still be a bit transparent and some to be opaque. And then I'm letting that dry and I'm doing that process again. And then I'm letting that dry and I'm doing that process again. Um, some, some paintings might have just two layers in one section and then five layers in another section. It really depends on what is happening in the painting and what has happened at that, in that layer and what has happened in that area. Um, I have a process, but it isn't a super, super strict process. Um, and I think I really, um, I try to, uh, oh, oh, this is, yeah, this is very important. So I lay out my palette with all my colors, all my pure colors, and then I take each one and I mix a really quick tint. And by what, what I mean by that is just, I mix a little bit of that color with white and basically just a mid-tone. I'm not tinting out a bunch of different values, just one just one, um, you know, each color is getting mixed with white. And so I'm, I find that that's incredibly important. You have a question? Well, when you were saying you mix a little bit of white, it, it's to a, a mid-tone of the original. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah kind of like, a, yeah, mid-tone, like, well, if I'm working in a really dark painting, I might make it a bit darker, meaning I'm going to have less white and I'm going to have yes. more pigment. But if I'm working in a really light painting, I might keep those tints a little bit lighter. Um, so I'm using all of those colors and I'm, I, that's as much pre-mixing as I do. And that's for a reason. Like, I don't, I don't want to pre-mix. I don't want to look at it, look at a painting and look at someone's skin and say, okay, well, their color is, their skin is this color. So I'm going to pre-mix, you know, these three colors for their skin. Yeah. Um, I want all of the variations that I'm going to get when I'm mixing on the spot. Um, but I still don't want, I don't want a totally messy palette. So my, so I do mix these tints, which helps. And then every layer I'm going in and I'm trying to get it more accurate, but every layer and every little inch of skin is going to be a slightly different, every brush stroke really is going to be a slightly different color. Um, yes. All of that, I want that because that is really having all that texture and variety and just layering and overlapping and kind of weaving together of brush marks and colors and transparencies and opacities that really creates uh, life in skin, because I feel like that that's more what our skin is made of. It's not just one kind of plastic thing. Yes. Um, I hope this makes sense. It's, it's, it again, is, it's hard yeah. to describe in words, but, um, lots of glazing opacity, uh, transparency and lots of layering. Um, and Rohini, if I'm, you know, if I'm making a really blue painting, um, like some of my recent work, uh, like one of the paintings is an ultra, like ultramarine blue, um, and I, so I'm going to be using ultramarine blue as, as my tinted oiling out as my glaze, like every, every layer before I, before I come in with, with my opaque so that the whole painting is kind of going to be embedded with this ultramarine blue. Um, and then I might do that with a thalo blue or a thalo green on a different painting. So knowing what color I want to go for, I'm going to use that color a bit more in the painting, especially in the glazing process. Yeah. Yeah. That makes um do you have a particular brand of paint that you like to use um the reason i'm asking you is because you really it sounds like you really like getting the most out of your paint um is the quality of the paint or the 
brand of paint important to you? Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So um, I'm not I'm not someone who is actually hugely into technical technical stuff, um, even though it might seem like that from the way that I paint. Um, so certain, I, I really, it's because of the color, like um, transparent maroon, I do Windsor Newton because that, because Windsor Newton's transparent maroon is just a really wonderful color. And um, this brown pink that I use for my underpainting is Sennelier because no other brown pink is that color. It's like, if you get brown yeah, pink right. in a different brand, it's gonna be an entirely different color. So um, I use a lot of Gamblin paints. I really like them. They're out They're out here in Portland. So they're kind of close to me. They've got great customer service. You can email them. They will give you great answers to questions. And I just always find their paint to be good quality um, and, you know, decently affordable. So I, I like them, but I'm really open. Like I will, you know, I definitely have some old Hollands. Um, yeah, it just depends on I don't know. I like to, I like to explore. Like I'll go to the art store and maybe try some new paint from a different brand and find yeah. a new favorite color. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty flexible and open with it. It's more, what is the color and does it work for me? Yeah. So just to give um, an idea, you were saying like in terms of layers, you're saying some places two, some places five, what's the most amount of layers you would say you have done on a painting? Glazes. Oh, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, probably a painting that I've messed up on and just can't quite get it. Maybe not messed okay. up on, but just really challenged by. Like, I just can't seem to get it, and I keep on having to try. That might have like seven or eight. Okay. I'm totally guessing on that number. Yeah. Yeah, I'm can't. I can't who, <laughs> there's a quote that's coming to my mind about uh, what artist used to say. Maybe it was Delacroix or somebody like that who was like. You know, unless it has 50 glazes or 50 layers, it doesn't count. <laughs> Do you know that quote? Oh, I don't know that quote, but I mean, yeah, might might be. I don't know. No, actually, I, I would I would disagree with the quote. I don't know it, but I would say sometimes it's just gorgeous at two layers and you want to keep yeah. that. But that might be one inch of the canvas and then near it, there's going to be a bit more. I mean, that's the weaving together. It's like the weaving yeah. together of all different layers of transparency and opacity and some you're going to see right through to almost almost the underpainting and then right next to it it could have could have a bit more yeah 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 um what kind of medium do you use um i use these days i've been using galkid light um i yeah i just find that it works i have to only pour out a little bit at a time because it gets really sticky really easily um hmm. The first layer I use Galkid Light and Mineral Spirits or sometimes just Mineral Spirits for the underpainting. Um, you know, one that you can paint with. Um, I use Gamzol. Um, but yeah, Gal Galkid Light seems to work for me. And I use it that the whole the whole way through. Okay, so no other oils, no walnut oil, linseed oil, none of that sort of uh, stuff. I used, I used to use walnut oil and linseed oil. Um, I really love them, but they uh, dry a little bit too slowly for me. I like things All to right. dry a bit faster. Okay. Yeah, those are great. Definitely love those. Uh, Aiden Baker Hill on Instagram says, um, "I'd love to know what brushes, paint, surface, medium, etc. you <laughs> that you like using. Uh, the way you paint form is so stunning. So you've covered the paint and the surface and the but just brushes. Do you have bruf, a brush preference? Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Aiden. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I. I. I mean. So I have brushes that I love, and then I will also go to the store and just discover some new ones, but I always have some silver bristlin brushes. Um, and I, I get them from Blick here, but I actually found them at Soho Art Materials when I was living in New York City. Um, that place is amazing, go there. Uh, and they have, well, they had them back then. Um, so I use a lot of those and I use between a size zero, zero and maybe three. Um, I use filberts. Filberts and rounds are my brushes, whatever brand they are. Um, yeah. And yeah, I find that the silver bristling are really, really great. So I'm generally using mostly those, but then I've, I've got, I've got some other ones thrown in there. I don't know those. What, what are they? Or how, I, silver bristling. I think they're, some, yeah. they're like synthetic um, bristle brush. Um, they just have a really good, um, I don't know. They just, they, they hold up well and they also wear down well. I like to, my brushes really get, they get used. I don't, I'm not precious with my brushes. Um, 
they get used <laughs> down to the nub and and I like how they wear down. I really like how they wear down because um, they're they're great when they wear down and then it depends on what I'm working on in a painting. If I'm working on something that really needs some sharp edges like hair or grass, I want a brand new brush. If I'm working on skin, quite often I want a brush that I have been using for a while. So it's kind of gotten a bit softer and more worn down. And so it doesn't have all these hard edges. Um, yeah, and those brushes kind of do work at every stage. And you get them in the, the different shapes, like the rounds and the flats and the filberts. It, but it's all um, yeah, silver mainly just, Yep. Yeah, but I mainly just use filberts with those. Um, okay. I'm not even sure if they have rounds. They might, but I, I just use filberts with those. Filberts are generally the brushes I use the most, although I definitely use rounds as well. And I will use a flat for hair or grass. Um, but I find filberts work for that too, as long as they're brand new. Okay. I've taken very good care of them. <laughs> Which all right. I've got, I've got lots of questions about skin, so I'm just going to bunch them all together. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Preetham Pai in India says, um, how to create the skin like texture? Which colors do you use? Beautiful paintings. And Jody O'Hara in North Carolina, Carolina says, uh, let's talk about that luminous skin. How do you achieve it? Your work is an inspiration to me. And no, Cynthia Cabrera in Canada says, I'd love it if you could share some technical insights into rendering skin. You capture the transparency and delicacy of it so beautifully. And then Kevin Mann on Patreon, thanks for the tea, Kevin, says, Hi, John and Aaliyah. Very nice use of paint control. I like your work. To me, your Instagram shows abstract energy mixed with realism. Very cool. Question. <laughs> I've played with skin tones on my art journey, but I've not managed to get the lush results that you get. Are there any tips uh, you would say are essential to control these subtle transitions? So. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so I, I did describe it a little bit, the process, yeah. but to go into it a little bit more, um, embrace accidents. I think that's a huge part of skin. Um, if I was going to paint uh, a Barbie doll and I wanted it to look plastic, and I'm not joking here, like if, really, if I wanted to, I, I would paint in an entirely different way than I paint now. Um, but I don't, I want to paint real people and plants and those all have variation in them and accidents. Um, so really embracing those accidents. And by that, I mean, like I, I might use a brush that has been worn down. And so it has these little kind of a little bit of a mind of its own and it'll it'll do some fun things for me um just because the you know the hairs are kind of sticking in random directions so embrace that um i think that's a huge part of it and and i really feel like that all these little tiny accidents layered together over and over with glazing in between and uh, opacity and transparency um woven together all of that creates this feeling of, of life. And I, I mean, it's kind of philosophical too, because I feel like that's really where life exists is in the in-betweens and in, in all the accidents. It's not in the perfection that that's a machine, you know, perfection is, and, and pre precision is a machine. And I know my paintings are very precise, but I'm getting at them through a lot of, a lot of um, little accidents, um, kind of controlled accidents, sometimes not so controlled accidents, but that I'm embracing it because it, because it works. Um, so I would say just not over controlling it, um, making sure that each, well, doing lots of layers with glazing for sure. That's a huge part of luminosity is, is the glazing, but then also making sure that you are not covering the, the entire painting with a full opaque layer every single time, allowing bits of underpainting to come through, allowing bits of transparency to come through and building up over time and also not pre-mixing everything perfectly and then just laying it on there. At least for me, it's it's really about the responding to my image or my model, um, whoever, I'm, whatever I'm working from. I mean, what, what I do now is from, from a photograph, but it works from life too. And just really responding intuitively in the moment and mixing colors intuitively in the moment with how you see them. And every time it's going to be a little bit different. And so just gathering all of these different things together and trying to find a cohesive um, wholeness. And again, glazing helps with that 
uh, that that will really create create um, a cohesiveness in the painting. Um, and doing that quite a few layers until it kind of comes to life. Um, there's certain layers of the painting that are are more controlled where I'm really trying to get the accuracy down, um, especially in a face, like really trying to get the the precise drawing of that nose or that mouth or those eyes down. Um, and then maybe the next layer, I'm really working on bringing in more energy and more life and more, um, yeah, yeah, just more more uh, liveliness. And and then it might the next layer might be a little bit more controlled again. And so going back and forth between between those, um, I use lots of tiny brushes as well. I don't use super large brushes. Um, I like to have a lot of tiny little brush marks because again, I feel like that replicates skin really well. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's kind of it. And if I can do this, I actually have a demo for sale um, that does describe, I show all of this. Um, I show from, it's about a five day process um, from beginning to end, but I do it in about an hour and eight minutes. I mean, I, I edit it down so you can actually see me see me do this. And if, if you just go to my, my Instagram, um, and go to my link tree, there is in there a demo. So you're welcome to, to get that. And then the, the really kind of shows, shows the process a bit more. I hope it's okay if I just plug that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. That's great. It's great that you have that resources there. Um, and yeah. from, from talking to artists, particularly because the skin thing comes up a lot. People ask questions about skin mm -hmm. and it seems that um, for painters like yourself who build up, you know, the skin, with many many layers that in a way it's kind of like recreating what skin is you know like skin is just a covering that you can kind of see through and then there are structures underneath that that maybe you're not aware of but you kind of register them as well and that you know it the painting skin in layers is almost like a way of recreating that do you think Oh yeah, hundred percent. I think you're right on there. It's, it's really about, um, and I feel like that actually with nature too, like with a rock for sure. It's like that it's, um, or with grass, um, with any, with any, anything, I mean, our bodies are nature too. It's, it's, it's about, it's not just about copying. It's like re recreating it. Um, it's like learning, like I, I think about, I'm going to go into nature a little bit here, but I think about painting all the complexities of, of, you know, a bunch of leaves on the ground um, or grass on the ground or just something that has a lot of texture and it's overwhelming. It's, it's really about discovering the language, like looking at that, studying it, discovering the language of, of what that, that thing is speaking, whether it's a rock, a tree, a, a human face, and then learning how to speak that. Um, so I'm not going in there and trying to get everything so completely accurate because I, I would go crazy. I am, my work is very realistic, but I can't, I can't, I can't do it that, that way. I have to, I have to like learn the language and then just kind of throw myself at the canvas, trying to speak that language the best way that I can. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, how do you check yourself as you're working? You know, like some artists, they use mirrors a lot. They turn the canvas upside down or they're taking photos with their phone or they're squinting like crazy or they're getting their friends in to tell, you know, to give them a little feedback. What do you do? Um, I, yeah, I actually do use my phone. I'll take photos of, of my painting um, to be able to see it a, in a different scale. Um, I, I have, yeah, actually sometimes I'll look in the mirror. Um, I have a mirror on one side of my studio that sometimes I'll just take a quick glance in to see do I still like this because I'm staring at it in one, in one context and to kind of reverse it a little bit, change it up helps. Um, I, so when I lived in New York around a bunch of artists and friends, we would definitely do, you know, studio visits with each other. And that was really helpful, but now thank God for technology. Um, I'll have little critiques with, with some friends, um, just over the phone or email each other work that really helps. Um, getting away from my work, going for a walk, taking a break. Yeah. Um, some, you know, sometimes I, yeah, sometimes I just need to not look at the painting for a little bit. Yeah. Very good. What kind of lighting setup do you have in your studio? Uh, I have daylight bulbs. Um, so I have a, I have a studio in my backyard, a um, little building in my backyard and 
it has these gorgeous windows, but they're all south facing. So, you know, on a cloudy day in Seattle, that's great, but we do get sun out here and then I get direct light. So I actually have to have these curtains over them. So I just have about six daylight bulbs on this little pulley system. Um, it's very, very funky looking, but it totally works. Um, and so the pulley system essentially allows me to raise or lower the lights depending right. on where I'm working on the canvas, um, or I can, you know, lower it all the way down to the floor or down to where I can reach it and I can turn the lights so that they're facing slightly different direction. Um, so yeah, nice. just daylight balance bulbs and then so that I can adjust them. And they're okay. kind of above, you, they're, they're above, they're above me. So they're not on a stand or anything. Okay. And do you have an independent light source on your palette or not? Nope. Nope. It's all no. just over me and my painting and everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, if anything, do you listen to as you work? Um, I listen to audiobooks, music, podcasts. Yeah. All those things. It depends on my mood. Um, I found so in my older work where it was really just 100% realism, I had to have like an audio book or something like that, some words to really keep me, keep me going, keep me, keep, keep my thinking mind busy. But now with my newer work, um, I'm having to not listen to words. I have to have music when I'm working on certain parts mm -hmm. of those and the more abstracted parts, I, I, I have to listen to music um, or even silence sometimes because um, I guess I need that part of my brain for this for this type of painting so that's been that's been interesting yeah uh vicky sullivan again on patreon says how do you come up with your titles mm, um a couple different ways um one thing i love to do is find a book that i love that i find to just have beautiful words and scan through it and my eyes just capture words and then I just start writing them down, the, the interesting ones, and then I'll just put them together and find interesting combinations or a little like quarter of a sentence, um, maybe then mixed with another quarter of a sentence. So it's sort of like a gathering of words from, from people who really know how to use words. So that's, that's one way. I haven't done that in a while though. Um, what I've been doing recently is really just sitting with the paintings and waiting for some words to come. Um, that, that feel like they, they fit the painting, but don't kind of pigeonhole it too much. Like I want to keep the paintings open enough for interpretation. Um, but it's also fun and good to be able to add another little kind of hint at something that yeah. could guide, guide someone into the painting differently than how they would have otherwise. Yeah. Very good. Kelly Johnson in Missouri says, Hi, Aaliyah. I'd like to know what leads you towards a near photorealistic style of painting? Is it just a personal preference or is there another reason for portraying your subjects this way? I love your work and I'm excited to hear the interview. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, it was Kelly, right? Thank yep. you. Um, I think a couple of things. So obsession, you know, uh, <laughs> since I was a little kid, I've just been obsessed with reality. Uh, but reality and, you know, I say that now and I feel like my, my version of reality is not what my version of reality was then, um, or my understanding of it. Um, but you know, it, it also ties into what I said at the very beginning about my inspiration being nature. And I think that real part of my obsession with realism has been because I felt like nature, na like no one can do it better than nature. So I'm going to use, you know, trying to find a better word than copy, but copy nature, um, uh, be inspired by nature or something. Um, it, it's just, yeah, it's been an obsession of mine since I can remember. I, there was, there's, there was just a magic in it. This, this, you know, this ability to, for an artist to be able to take pigment, um, or even just graphite and put it on paper or canvas and then have it become something way more than the sum of its parts, I have always found to be really magical. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that that's, that's yeah. kind of where that, where that comes from. Yeah, do you think that the motivation um, for you, but for also for other artists as well, is not so much to try and copy nature, but to try and beat <laughs> the transience of nature? You know, like if you see a beautiful sunset or a beautiful something or other, um, some part of you is going, this is beautiful, but it's not going to last. And that that kind of pushes the, well, let me see if I can just maybe capture this. 
So it'll, it, yeah. so it'll be there. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, I think it's, that's about time as well. Like, let me, let me find this moment and stretch this moment into infinite time, you know, as long as the painting will last. Um, yeah, I think artists, we, we want to do the impossible. <laughs> and so we, we attempt to in that way. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, God, I'm really enjoying this podcast. I've listened to a few now and they're brilliant. And there's so many of them. And I've learned so much from listening to them. And you know what? If I met that John Dalton fella in real life, I'd love to buy him a cup of tea and have a chat with him. I'd love to do that every month if I could. Well, now you can. The tea part, at least, because this podcast runs on cups of tea bought for me by people like you who listen to the podcast and send me the price of a cup of tea once a month through the Patreon account. That's patreon.com forward slash John Dalton gently does it. All one word. And if you're one of those people who already send me cups of tea through Patreon, thanks a million. The tea is lovely and I really appreciate it. Now, the great thing is that if you can't afford to send me the price of a cup of tea or you don't want to, that's fine. You still get exactly the same podcast for free. It's sort of an honor system where the people who can afford it and want to pay for the people who can't or don't want to. So it's all lovely. So if you'd like to send me a cup of tea once a month, you can do that through Patreon. I'd really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference to me. Okay, a lot of questions now about the change in your work. So this this again will be like, if you feel like you've answered it, just that's fine. Yeah, say it. sounds good. Uh, Sarah Gallagher on Patreon. Thanks for the tea, Sarah says absolutely love this artist from narrative realist to portrait artist to abstractionist also fabulous i'd never heard that before abstractionist did you i don't think i have but i really like that and yeah it's good isn't it abstractionist yeah Uh, Uh, thanks to both john and Aaliyah for having this chat my question there is an obvious shift recently in your work however there were more subtle departures along the way over the years can you speak about the inspiration slash courage that it takes to make those subtle differential pieces within those bodies of work, like the inclusion of landscape pieces or abstract moments? Um, thank you so much. Um, is it Sarah? Sarah? Sarah, Sarah? yeah. Sarah, thank you. yeah. Sarah, I really appreciate those, uh, your words, and also noticing all the little subtle mm. changes. Um, yeah, it's very perceptive. Um So I feel like as an artist, I mean, I've been an artist for longer than I was making money from it. And so it was always about following something inside of me and being excited about something and wanting to push myself always. And so that hasn't changed. It's just gotten, I guess, a little bit more scary since I make a living from this, which is where the courage part comes in, I think. Um, But I think Yeah, I think it's really about every painting, just trying to be excited, like being just always kind of being on, on my, on my edge, like pushing myself. And there's definitely been times where, um, I haven't pushed myself so much, um, where I'm, I'm feeling like I'm a little bit safe, staying a little safe, but when I'm in that stage, it doesn't feel very good. So I want to push myself more. I want to constantly be growing and changing and just getting better. Um, so I think it's just what naturally happens because, because of that constant wanting to push myself and get better. My work is going to change. I'm going to try new things. Um, and in terms of the landscapes, I started doing landscapes in my final, maybe two years in New York city. Um, I was there for a total of five, five and a half years. And first couple of years, I was like, loved it. I mean, I still, I love New York city, but I I remember thinking I'd miss trees and I didn't, which was odd, but then I started to really miss nature. And I I found I was painting in my like very industrial studio and I was just craving nature. And so I started painting it so that I could go to the studio and be in it. Um, So that's where that came from. Um, Never thought that I would do that, but but it just, it just, it, it was interesting to me. And if I'm not interested in something 
I'm going to really struggle painting. My paintings take a long time and they, they take a lot of energy and focus. And if I'm not interested, it's just going to be near impossible to actually paint it. So just staying interested. I think that's where the changes, the changes happen, all the subtle changes you're talking about and also the big recent change, but maybe we'll, I'll talk more about that with the following questions, but um, yeah, just staying interested. Okay. Um, Matt, Matab uh, Mohammadi in California says, I'm surprised by seeing huge changes in your work. I even love them more. May I ask what has happened to your thoughts that caused this major change? And Ray Allen Parker on Patreon. Thanks for the tea, Ray. Says, thank you, John, for your great inspirational podcast. You're welcome, Ray. Um, Aaliyah, as others have noted, your work has recently undergone a profound change in both subject matter, palette, and technique. What provoked the change and how did you arrive at or develop the process for creating your current your current style of work? Okay. Um, thank you so much for these questions. Um, I also really appreciate how many questions there were because I was looking through some of them about the new work, um, which is great because it was it was quite scary to, <laughs> to, to begin to put this work out in the world. So how do I tell this story? Um, it was a long, slow process. Um, I, I feel like my work before the change, I was, I was feeling like I was painting myself into a corner a little bit. Um, where in the painting process, my only goal really technically was, does it look real? And that was starting to just not feel good anymore. I was feeling kind of controlled. I was feeling, yeah, like I was stuck in a corner, sort of like this claustrophobic feeling. I wasn't really free anymore. And so it was a combination of feeling that. Um, and then COVID hit us all and completely changed our worlds. And um, I had all this alone time. Everything was canceled. I think I'm not the only artist listening or, you know, I'm talking, listening in this conversation right now that maybe loved that. Um, even though I know there were so many terrible, terrible things, not to diminish that, but there was something about everything being canceled and the quietness and the excuse to just be with myself um, that really gave me permission to change my work. Um, I started doing these really quick left-handed drawings, mostly left-handed, some sometimes right, but mostly left-handed drawings. Um, I say drawings, but they're with paint on paper, ingested paper, and I was just doing these really quick drawings. And I think I started one night where I was just, may have actually been before COVID, but here in the US, I won't get into politics, but it's just been a, it's been a dark time. <laughs> and I, I think I was just feeling it. I can't remember, but it was just a really dark night for me. And I went to my studio and I was probably also struggling with my paintings, whatever I was working on. And I just was like, I just need to be free. I just need to do something free. Like I'm, I'm just exhausted from everything. And so I just did a bunch of paper and just started painting on them. And these really ugly images started coming out. And I found that to be really exciting. There was something in them that just felt so much more alive. I felt like I was a kid again. Um, I felt like, oh, this is what people talk about when they, you know, when they say, oh, you're an artist, you must just be like in bliss in the studio and get to have creative expression all the time. And it's like, no, it's, it's really not. But I actually felt a bit of that or a lot of that and because it was just, I, I, I was used to painting from the outside, you know, from, from, from the world outside of me, from other people. Um, even when I would paint a self-portrait, still my, it was my external self. And these were all coming from some internal world that I just hadn't explored. And yeah, and then lockdown happened and I just started diving into these even more. And I was sitting with them. I was meditating, meditating one evening by the fire and just I mean, by meditating, I was really just contemplating and thinking and watching images go through my head. And I had these images, these, these quick drawings I had done, they were kind of sticking with me. And I just started to see them in, with, with, with realist elements in them and um, kind of a combination of my styles because I still love 
And I think I will always love realism. It's like my first language. Um, and so I, I went to the studio the next day and set my camera up on a tripod and um, got naked in my studio and started taking photographs of myself kind of in the positions that I found in, in the, in the, uh, in the, in these quick drawings, which are not always really possible, anatomically possible. I just started taking these photographs and then, and then I took both the photographs I took of myself. And then the, then I took photos of the drawings and in Photoshop played around with them and then took photos of my garden, little weedy patches of my garden, little, little growing things and kind of put it together. But it was all, it all started internally. It all started in my imagination, which as I said, imagination that was really challenging for me and yeah completely opened up and um and then it all went from there so yeah <laughs> is there more to that and more of the questions but i know there, there's... there are more questions but one that occurs to me is um the drawings that you make are relatively small are the paintings the finished paint they look a bit bigger than the drawings are they yeah yeah, the the drawing the drawings are all about um what are they like sketchbook size like nine yeah. nine and a half by eleven inches. They're they're small, yeah. Um the paintings, so the recent paintings um in my in my show right now in, in Hong Kong, um they are all forty eight by forty inches. So yeah. larger than the drawings, but not very large for me. Um yeah, just decided to go a little bit a little bit smaller, but still large enough. Um, for these ones, because I wanted to experiment a little bit more. And yeah, I'm curious to know how you got the drawings, um, how you recreated them on the canvas and still kept the energy of them. Um, like, did you draw them with your? Did you paint them with your left hand again on the bigger canvas? And a bit of a bit of both. I actually, wood a little bit. Um, really big brush, completely changing my brush size. Um, and uh, lots of nerves <laughs> just being just knowing like okay I'm gonna try to recreate this energy without it looking contrived um did you and, put them on you know, the floor did you paint on the floor or did you put them on no, the no I painted them yeah I I don't use an easel I just lean the paintings against my wall or prop them up on a box okay. or something in my studio um but yeah I had them had them on the wall but sometimes it would get a little too drippy and I didn't want it to drip so then I would put it on the floor right um but they all start on the wall yeah, I mean, I would just try to try to recreate it without being too accurate, like still allowing them to change. So the paintings, the 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 final paintings, are different from the original conception yes. of them, and yeah. that's also what I find to be so much fun about these paintings is how much they do change through the painting process. I might, you know, I definitely have have an idea. I know the colors I'm going to use basically, but although that can change, I know. Um, the basic composition, although that can change. Um, and that change is really fun. It's, it's, it's great to actually be able be a till like, it's great to, uh, be allowed to, uh, shift, shift things up and, and change them and explore new, um, new solutions to new problems that arise. Yeah. Um, was it a case of just trying to, um, recreate the painting and from the drawing or were you also trying to get into the internal space that you were in when you made the drawing as you make the painting? Um, a little bit of both, I think. I didn't want to entirely get into the internal space because sometimes that was kind of challenging space to get into, but mm -hmm. I also didn't want to just copy. Um, yeah, I didn't want to just copy it. So yeah, yeah a, a little, little bit of both, but also knowing that it's an entirely new thing. Yeah. it's different from the drawing. the drawing was the seed this is something different yeah and then i'm guessing then you would have done the, the more realist bits after like the you would have done the yeah. more abstract or freer bit first and then put the yeah the exactly right. so the abstract bit is really the foundation we'll just call it up i mean it's people have called it many different things but um that that's really the foundation and the the rest of the painting is really built up around that yeah, it's funny, isn't it? That I'm assume I'm guessing, but I imagine that, like you were saying, oh, you were you were nervous doing the abstract bit, yeah. Um, and then you, I'm guessing you would have been like, oh, great, now I can just do the realist bit, which is a complete flip on <laughs> the way yeah. it would have been, say, as a kid, you know, with that kind of, 
you know, very free. I'm just going to pay. I don't care. <clears throat> and then, oh, how am I going to do that realist bit? You know, how do I pay? How do you actually draw an arm that looks like an arm? <laughs> it's I mean, the so inversion of that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's completely true. Um, it's interesting because the rules completely change. You know, people say like, oh, my kid could do that drawing. It's like, yeah, yeah, got, yeah, because kids know something. They're free. But like when you have so much training and you've and you've trained your your eyes and your hands to just like create something that looks like something there are these rules and you have a goal you know the end of the road you know where i mean there's going to be some variation but you basically know what you want it to look like when it's when you're dealing with something that isn't realistic every single mark matters and so i've definitely spent a lot of time just making a mark and then sitting back and looking at it and thinking does that work and then, I mean, I'm learning so much right now. I feel like I'm a, I'm, I'm a student completely. I'm, I'm learning about how to see completely differently and like see, see a brush mark and what is the energy in that brush mark or what, it, you know, what is this kind of abstracted face? Is this actually describing what I want to describe or is it totally off and why? Whereas before it's like, well, it does it look real? Yes or no. And, and, and why does it look not real. And then I can figure it out. Um, so it's completely uncharted waters for me. Um, cause as I said, even since I was a little kid, I, I was obsessed with realism. So it's completely different. Um, but I know that there was a point before I was obsessed with realism. There was a, there was a point there. And I think I'm just trying to get back to something, something about that, that just pure energy, pure, um, expression of in, in some way, but I'm yeah. still using all my training. It's just using it in a completely different way and turning it inside out. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's been exciting and really challenging. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, okay. Ian Gardner on Instagram says your work lately has had such a dramatic and beautiful shift. What was it that inspired you to make that shift? And was it scary knowing that people might expect something else out of you? Was there an aha moment or was it more of a slow building into something new? So again, if you feel like you've answered that, that's fine. But if I mean, that's tri triggered anything new. Um, so was it scary, like knowing that people would expect something different? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, like that was really scary, honestly. Um, painting them originally, you know, when COVID was happening, it was just like, okay, everything's canceled. Let me just play around and I'm gonna see what happens. Um, I knew that there was a shift happening though. Um, so it actually was a slow, long kind of, uh, shift that I, that I was aware of long before it actually started showing up in my work. Um, but I didn't really know what it was yet. And then when I knew what it was, that, that, that felt good. And then when I realized, oh shit, I need to like share these with people and, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't need to, but I, I want to, like, I want to share this. And then, oh my God, what are people going to say? And what are they going to think? They expect this one thing. I've, I've had so much success in this one thing. I'm going to lose everyone, <laughs> you know, Yeah. but I, I really had to just be okay with that. Um, but I have to say it took, it was, it was, it took so much courage and which basically means fear, just like standing in the fear and the discomfort and being with it. That's really what courage is, not a lack of fear. Um, yeah, it was really scary. Yeah. But you guys have been great. Thank you so much for all the support <laughs> on Instagram as I share this new work. I just really, really appreciate it. It's 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 meant a lot to me. So I just want to thank everyone. Oh, lovely. Uh Penny Moz on Patreon, thanks for the tea, Penny, says, adding to Ian's question, did you receive any negative feedback after changing the direction with your style of art? And if so, how did you handle it? Um, yeah, I got two comments. Um, it's funny, I remember, of course I remember. Um, and I'd like to say that I didn't matter at all, that, that it didn't matter. Um, what that these people didn't like the new work, but it, it, it to I totally felt it because it was, it was, that was the fear that people are going to be like, nope, not like, uh, this is terrible. Um, but then I just had to realize like, Hey, they're not my audience. That's okay. It just took, it took about, you know, a couple hours for me to let it go, but I'm human and I take it in for sure. 
um, yeah, you know, just, just realizing I'm not painting for everyone. I prepared a lot before actually publicly sharing these on Instagram. Um, I, you know, shared a lot with friends and I had an open studio, um, with just some, some friends here in Seattle and, and that really helped to be able to share with people before then really sharing publicly. Um, and it was just yeah. a lot of internal work, just knowing, okay, I'm painting. I, I, I can never please everyone. And if people don't like this new work, that's okay. They don't need to, I'm not doing it for them. Um, I, I need to do this for myself and I'll, I'll find my audience. So I'm actually really, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really surprised at how I feel like my audience has adapted to the new work and really appreciated. it. I've, I've, I've been really surprised. I didn't actually think it was going to be um, quite so embraced. So, I mean, maybe that's just because that's what people are saying, but um, I really appreciate that. It's, it's been, it's been quite gratifying. Lovely. Uh, Brian Ashing in Trinidad says, I adore the shift in your work. Are you asking yourself just different questions as part of the creative process now? Was this wonderful shift in your visuals sparked by a desire to answer any new creative questions? Hmm. Yes, I would say it definitely, it definitely is about asking, maybe not answering, but asking new questions. I don't know what those questions are exactly in words. I think that's why I'm a painter. Um, I think the new work is about exploring things that are more internal and more um, about my, my own internal emotions. Um, it's about discovering more like a yeah it's more it's more discovering and reflecting what's going on in inside of me versus trying to look at the outside worlds and find myself through the outside world um and yeah i'm not sure exactly what i, I don't i don't want to put words to the emotions exactly that i'm trying to explore the questions i'm trying to explore because i feel like that i mean i love it when people do that but i i, I don't want to do that because i don't i don't want people to think that they're about one thing because they're about a million things yeah. Um, but yeah, for sure. Totally new, new, new questions, new emotions. Um, yeah. Thank you. Oh, all right. Uh, Kathleen Stewart on Patreon. Thanks for the tea. Kathleen says, as always, John, thanks for your work and this excellent podcast. You're welcome, Kathleen. Aaliyah, it's difficult to come up with enough accolades to describe your work. You've always rendered the figure so classically, but with such a contemporary voice and edginess. I listened to the video on your website, beautifully crafted in brackets, describing the genesis of your current direction, which has helped me with insight into your recent series of paintings. In general, as painters evolve their stylistic expression, you can follow their evolution over time and see a series of mini steps. You've taken such a dramatic step in this regard. My question is, was it intimidating to make such a bold leap? And how did you muster the courage to put it out there? Perhaps I'm projecting and you actually found it quite easy. So again, if you feel like you've answered that already, <laughs> exactly. that's fine. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for, for watching the film. Uh, my husband and I made that together and it was super fun to do that. I, I really, it was uh, a whole other art form actually. And so thank you for watching that. Um, yeah, yeah it's a great, it, little, great little film. Really good. Really, you know, very, I think it's four minutes long and it's, conveys a lot thank you yeah we tried to get everything in there just but also not make it too full <laughs> say, it, say it simply um but try to say it all um can you can you remind me of what kathleen's last question was was it remind, she was remind talking you. about courage and the courage to put it out there was it intimidating to make such a bold leap and how did you muster the courage to put it out there um and, She's wondering yeah. if she's projecting or if you found it easy. Oh, no, I didn't find it easy, but I found it necessary. Um, but I think I found it easier because of COVID, because of the time that that gave, but then also more challenging because of COVID, because less paintings were selling. And so I, you know, I make a living from this and I needed to 
try to just figure that out so, so that yeah, I can still take these risks. Um, but yeah, I found it very scary, um, but necessary. And I think because, yeah, again, because of COVID, I, I just had the, the space and time and permission. I gave myself the permission. It was, it was really, honestly, it was just so necessary. I was getting to a point where I just couldn't keep doing what I was doing. Um, which almost makes it easier. I mean, it does make it easier, but not less scary, I think. Um, yeah, it was just a shift that, that had, that had to happen. It just absolutely yeah. had to happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Doriel Kami, former podcast guest, uh, says, what was or were the catalyst or events that compelled you to evolve, to evolve your work, to include the abstract spiritual and unseen oh doriel um we went to undergrad at cornish together so she's a good friend of mine she's great thank you doriel for the questions um yeah well i mean what was the catalyst and i mean i it, again i think just some internal i guess we'll, we'll maybe not again i'll go into some other stuff but some just internal emotional um work I think um growing up getting older um dealing with difficult emotions um realizing the world is not always an easy beautiful idyllic place and learning to try to make something beautiful out of that and be okay with it and be in the difficulties um yeah, I, I feel like it really mirrored a an internal change of mine where I was just getting in touch with myself in a, in a way that I hadn't before. I'm someone who's always very much looked to the outside world to kind of create myself, my own shape, or I used to. Um, I'm a number nine on the Enneagram, if anyone's into that. <laughs> I'm like very much in the, yeah, like I really wanna make, make other people around me happy. Um, and I feel like I used to, kind of define myself through through the outside world and so this these paintings were a reflection of the fact that I was trying to define myself from my inner world just define myself and discover my shape and sort of um be a person from internally I, I mean I know I know I'm getting kind of esoteric here but I'm sure many of you artists understand this but it's just a reflection of what was going on internally not necessarily literally um in terms of the paintings but um yeah, just getting in touch with my internal self and learning to embrace even difficult things. Right. Is Doriel right? Are you including uh, spiritual and unseen elements in, in these new paintings? Um, yeah, I would definitely say so, but not in a literal sense. Um, I think, so I kind of see the paintings, um, the realist elements as being rooted in the our physical reality, this world that we live in. And then I see the abstracted elements and even the skies because they kind of become abstracted as kind of representing and embodying um, all that we can't see that I'm learning really exists. And perhaps some of this is due to some psychedelic, um, very guided psychedelic experiences um, that have really opened up my world to, and, and also just meditation um, opened up my world to the fact that there is much more to existence than what meets the eye and what we actually see in the physical world. I find that to be quite a relief um, and a comfort and an inspiration. I mean, it's it's really good to know that there's maybe a bigger picture to what's going on in the world. Um, and there's way more than what we can see because if this is all that exists, you know, there's a lot of ugliness and difficulty and um, fear and sadness in the world. and and that shows up physically and, but there's also so much beauty and joy and unseen things that are happening that, that I find empowering and hopeful. And so I think I'm trying to get all of that into the work without being too literal about it. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, Casey uh, Crosscheck uh, on Instagram says, Hi, Leah. I'm curious if the shift in your work was a conscious decision 
to address and or release a different emotion than you were addressing slash releasing in your previous works. If so, can you touch on this, especially how and why you were able to make the shift? And now, not only do I deeply admire your work, but I also, uh, but also your bravery to make such a bold shift. I always believed I was brave in my own work, but I'm just starting to realize how much I'm holding back. So thank you for your bravery. It's inspiring. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, I have to say, I think that we're, we're always having to become more courageous. I don't think there's any point where we're where we've done it, and then there's not another layer to push. Um, so you're you're on the right path. Yeah, I mean, I, I I mentioned this a little bit, but maybe it'll come out differently now. I think uh, the work before it was it was about looking at the external world, looking at other people, trying to def, you know just define who I am. Um, through these other people and through through the external worlds, um, and the newer work is about um, exploring and pulling out uh, what's going what what what's happening inside of me, and um, making visible the invisible. And um, yeah, as I've said many times, it was it was quite scary, and and the catalyst was COVID and the world being challenging, <laughs> and yeah. having time to to dive in yeah viewed from that perspective has it occurred to you that it's a kind of a benjamin button kind of thing going on you know <laughs> you started off painting these uh women who are you know in later life and you're yeah. sort of come back now and you're sort of got a more of a childlike uh, thing going backwards you're sort of going you know backwards in time yeah i'd never thought about it in terms of benjamin button but yeah my show is called walking backwards the one that i that all this work is uh, is showing right now in Hong Kong at Flowers Gallery. Um, yeah, it, it's called Walking Backwards because it's about that feeling and that kind of attempt to walk backwards to mm. a time when I, time when I didn't, I don't know, some some more, more um, yeah, time when I didn't have all this training really and I could access yeah. something that, that, was, that was inside of me. Yeah. Um, Anne Manuel in Canada says, I'm interested in the moment you realized a change was afoot or needed. How? Why? Um, what was it within you and around you, the push and pull factors, scary or was it a natural process? Um, hi, Anne. Great to hear from you. Um, yeah, I mean, it, um, it wasn't one moment. It was, uh, what was catalyst? I mean, lots, lots of catalysts. Um, my work was becoming, I was feeling like I was walking myself in the corner and, um, I mean, I've kind of answered these questions, I think, but I, yeah, yeah. but Anne, I, I really appreciate you asking these, asking these questions. Um, yeah, I needed to make the change. It, it just had to happen. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Um, Melanie uh, Frutado in Canada says, oh, love this podcast. I'd be curious to hear if you had or have an internal dialogue or conflict about your traditional trainings with its rules in inverted commas and the new work, new work you're making, which eloquently blends them. Um, yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Um, I, yeah, I do have an internal conflict or I did. I think I've I think I'm having less conflict with it because of I guess now I have a different relationship with the realism, but um, the con yeah, I was having conflict with the with the realist stuff because it, it had been my whole life, my 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 obsession since I can really remember. Um, I remember drawing a tree when I was in kindergarten, and I remember it looked it looked so real to me uh, at that stage, and I was just like, this this is what I want to do, <laughs> and that was kindergarten, you know, and um, so it was. It was a long process, but it was also really quick of like realizing, oh my God, my world is changing. I, I, something I thought I knew for sure isn't sh at all sure anymore. And what that was is realism is God, basically. Like that is my, <laughs> my, my constant goal and guiding light. And that completely changed. And I started, um, wanting to do different kinds of work. Um, I think I, um, yeah, I, 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 so I had conflict. I started not liking realism really, um, which was really hard for me because it's been my love forever. Um, and I, but now I, now I 
still love it because I'm able to use it intentionally when I want to and not use mm. it when I don't want to. So I think it's, and I think actually in the paintings, you can kind of see a bit of that conflict. At least I can see that, the, the, the conflict between the two and the struggle yeah. between the two and hopefully some sort of resolution between the two. Yeah. When you were going through that process, did you go to like research how other, other artists manage their transition from one period to another or once, you know, styling painting and all, or did you just go internally the whole way? Yeah, just really internally. I, um, yeah, tried to just go internally. Yeah, all right. And because if I look too much at other people, then um, I might try to be too much like them. And again, my, you know, what I've been trying to get away from is looking at the outside world so much and really mm. trying to. Uh, well, I, did, I, I didn't actually mean the painting, but, you know, I was trying to think about somebody like Picasso who went through very distinct periods yeah. and um I don't know. Did Picasso did Picasso write a biography? I don't think he did. An autobiography. Um, no, but there's but, books on him. I I haven't really. I mean, I've I've definitely learned a little bit about his story for sure, and that's like knowing about him has definitely been an inspiration. You know, um, hmm. just knowing that there are are that there are artists who have changed. And actually, Jenny Savile, like she, her work hmm. really started to change. When was that? I'm not exactly sure. Eight years ago, something. It it it, it changed drastically, and I found that to be quite an inspiration um yeah so yeah i i think just knowing that there were other artists but no one specific but just knowing that it was possible yeah musicians are brilliant for that they're always like every three or four years they complete reinvention exactly <laughs> absolutely the David Bowie, for example my god yeah yeah absolutely musicians and it's more expected i feel like with musicians they just it's maybe not yeah. i don't know it's yeah but it got to be the same thing with painters um okay last question about the change uh tiffany d in seattle says i'd love to know how you feel about your previous work does it feel like you're still connected to it does it feel like uh does it feel like they were painted by a different person um thanks tiffany hi we're in the same city um yeah it feels like well it feels like it's me but like a different chapter of me um, yeah. I definitely appreciate the past work, not all of them. Sometimes, you know, there's definitely work that I don't love and other works that I, I do love and I can definitely appreciate, but they, it just feels like a different chapter in my life. Um, not an entirely different person, but different, different chapter, different layer of, of who I am. All right. Um, Miguel Carter Fisher in Virginia says, in your experience, what's the relationship between painting and empathy? How has painting impacted how you relate to others in your daily life? And has painting changed how you define beauty? Oh, uh, great question. Hi, Miguel. We went to graduate school together at New York Academy. Uh -huh. um, same class. Um, yeah, I mean, I think painting uh, and empathy are, are, are at least the way that I, that I, that I paint because as, as people um, go completely hand in hand. And I feel like the more I paint people, um, uh, the more empathetic I do get. And it's interesting, I, I had this experience of um, kind of empathy towards myself a little bit once. I, I, I was painting a self-portrait, which I really didn't wanna do, but I had to do for something. And, and I was looking at the photographs and I just was judging myself and then, as soon as I just decided, okay, I'm just gonna paint, I'm just gonna use this as my reference. And I started painting it. I completely looked at myself differently and saw so much beauty there that I didn't see before. And I think, and that made me realize how I do that with other people too. I just didn't realize it to the degree because um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's much more obvious when it's, when it's myself. But um, I think painting people just helps me see their humanity because there's so much beauty and struggle in everyone's lives and in everyone's bodies and faces and just getting to spend hours and hours and hours with that, I think really um, supports empathy, um, whether you're painting from life or photograph. And I think, Miguel, I think you paint from a life a lot. So I think that that uh, is probably even more. Um, but yeah, I think they go hand in hand. I think being empathetic is a huge part of, huge part of painting. Lovely. 
Evan Lilly on Patreon, thanks for the tea, Evan says. Thank you, John, for the thoughtful interviews. This is the first Patreon page I've ever supported. Oh, great. That's great, Evan. I'm happy to be there first. <laughs> My question for Aaliyah is, how important is it for you personally to have friends who are also full-time artists? Mm, good question. Um, I think it's very important. Um, I think it's very important to have friends who do all sorts of things. Uh, I, I'd say my closest friends who are artists are all from graduate school, although also Joriel from, from undergraduate. Um, yeah, I think it's so important because they understand, they get it. They really, there's some intangible things just about the way that you see the world and the way that you live your life and the way that you just are that only other artists really understand. Um, that being said, I also really appreciate having my friends who aren't artists because they help me just live in in <laughs> the world and have life experiences. And it's really interesting to see the world through other people's eyes, just through conversations or or whatever. So yeah, I think it's really important to have to have both. Yeah. At least in my experience. Sarah Gallagher on Patreon again says, do you consider each piece individually or is there a relatively clear idea to how large the thematic body of work as a whole will be? Uh, it usually starts out with an individual painting um, and then that will quite often lead to more of a whole, but it depends. So there's certain shows, like I had a show in New York called Body Being and it was all... I knew that the whole show was going to be these paintings of, of figures nude from about um, mid thigh up and all sorts of people. Um, so that one, I definitely knew the whole show. Um, and then this most recent show in Hong Kong with the new work, I knew that I wanted them all to be a certain scale. I knew that I wanted them to be, um, have these certain elements in them and each one to be a slightly different color. Um, so I did know that, but I didn't know that at the very beginning. So I feel like each, each, kind of show or series starts out with just an, an individual painting that I just want to explore and just and figure out and then and then that will kind of open the door to perhaps a theme I don't want to I don't want my I don't want to be too kind of contained in a theme but I also like to have some containment because that kind of brews some good creativity um, so I think it's a combination between having some some borders and then really allowing freedom within that yeah. Uh, Madeline Bailey in Canada says, I'd love to express what a massive fan I am of Aaliyah and her work. Her pieces have a striking quality that makes you stop, go back and look many times. I know when I first saw her work, I wrote her name down so I could take a better look at her paintings after my kids went to bed so my mental space had less noise to compete with what I was taking in visually. I'd love to know what Aaliyah's favorite subject or muse is to paint. And I'd also love to know what kind of art hangs around her home. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Madeline. I really appreciate that. Um, what is my favorite subject or muse? I mean, nature, whether it's a person or the natural environment. Totally. I mean, any, any, of, any of those things are my favorite. Um, in terms of what kind of art hangs around my walls, my, my house is really small. Um, I don't have tons of wall space, but I do have um, some friends artwork up and I have two amazing Aliene de Souza Howell prints. And I'll, I know only you can see right now, John, but there's, there's one right there. Oh yeah. Romulus and Remus Wolf. I was gonna say, oh. that looks like Romulus and Remus. Yeah. Amazing. So I've got two of her large prints that takes up pretty much my two large walls. And so um, I don't live with my own art. I can't have my own art around um it's in my studio <laughs> yeah i can't i can't have it in my in my house all right um if there was one underlying theme to all your work what do you think it would be hmm. oh that's really challenging i mean i want to just say life <laughs> that's like kind of cheesy and vague um but I think the reason why I say life is because what I mean by that is like the, what do I mean by that? I mean, it's like the physical reality, the physical, physical world, like the molecules of what makes up the world we can see. And then also what animates that. I'm always trying to paint that. Um, John, you know how you talked about my work at the very beginning, 
trying to yeah. kind of get that get get that's absolutely a goal so i think i think maybe that yep okay um uh, aixa uh, oliveras in florida says how do you balance the demands of social media with the artist's need for solitude when creating art also i love the new direction uh, your work is taking it's very inspiring Thank you so much. Um, oh yeah, social media. I mean, I find it, I find it kind of challenging, and I'm, I'm sure anyone who follows me on Instagram sees I have periods where I'm posting pretty often, and then I might go months without posting. And I know that, you know, technically you're not supposed to do that if you want followers, but I find for myself, I need to just disappear at times. And um, when I'm disappearing, I'm, or when I'm disappeared from this, from the socials, I'm making tons of work. Um, so I think for me, <clears throat> it's about knowing when to share and when not to share. Uh, there are plenty of people who post process photos and for them that absolutely works. And that's, that's great for me. That doesn't work at all. I need to, I need to keep, keep those things kind of close to me. So I think it's knowing, knowing when you need to keep things close to you and knowing when you want that feedback from the outside world and also having your priorities straight. I mean, social media is really important for careers as, as, as artists these days, but um, I always think the most important thing is your relationship with your studio and your work. And so I try to always put that first um, yeah. and, and post, post when I need to, usually before a show. Yeah, very good. Um, Manuela Pills in Australia says, love this podcast. That's great, Manuela. Thank you. Would love to know about your experience in Ovieto and the workshop you did there. It looked fascinating. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Orvieto was amazing. So um, yeah, I taught a workshop there um, a couple summers ago, some, summer before COVID. I was going to do it the following summer and then COVID happened. Um, so what I, the, the workshop itself uh, is actually now kind of the workshop that I have begun to teach online and various, you know, when I, when I do teach, um, what we do is really explore painting skin and bringing skin to life. And so um, we go in and we kind of abstract the body into these tiny forms. Um, and I, I, I have students get a lot of different canvases and make a lot of paintings. Um, so we're not doing traditional figurative painting. We're not painting a full model. Um, there's plenty of artists who teach that so well. And I'm just I have other things that I think are better suited for me to teach, such as the actual application of paint on canvas or panel. Um, and it's, it's relationship to describing skin. And so we really dive into that and it's really, really fun and really freeing. <clears throat> and I teach the process that I teach, um, with this layering and glazing and, um, yeah, it's a really, really fun. We do some drawing as well. Um, just really, really quick, loose, large sketches of the whole body, kind of seeing the whole flow through the body. And so kind of we have a scale thing where you're doing the whole body, but then also going into these details. Um, yeah, and that was that was a really great opportunity. And it really <clears throat> showed me that I I could teach a more unique workshop that felt more suited to my skill set and what I had to offer. Mm. And so now if you take a workshop with me anywhere, um, I don't do them often, but, but if I do, that's, it's going to be some version of that. Yeah. That was, was that part of Vincent Desiderio's thing or was it yes. after, just yep. a little bit it was, after it or a little bit before it or something like that? I think I can remember him telling yeah, me about it, was, it. It was the week after, um, yeah. but it was part of their program. Um, but it was the week after. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. Wonderful experience. And Orvieto is just gorgeous. Lovely. Uh, Rachel Zaire in Canada says, as a current undergrad, I'm wondering what the most important factor was for you personally when deciding on an, an MFA program. Um, yeah, so I discovered the New York Academy of Art and knew I had to go there because everyone was painting. Well, everyone was painting and everyone is painting, well, also sculpture, but um, figurative and realism and some skills that I hadn't really learned very much of. Um, I think things have changed a lot. This was, I started in 2010 in graduate school and graduated in 2012. And I think a lot like traditional figurative stuff is definitely being taught more in schools now, but 
Um, for me, it was, I wanted to be in a place where I would really learn that and where I would be, where that type of work would be embraced. But I also wanted to be in a place where I'd be pushed um, conceptually. I didn't want to just go to an atelier as great as those programs can be. I didn't want to just go to one and learn one way of painting. I really wanted to go to a place where I could be encouraged and pushed not only technically and in many different languages technically by being pushed conceptually um and then being in new york city you know just being among all of that history and um and being so close to galleries and the access that we had um i mean it really it really made my career happen i think being being there just being right in that kind of vortex i, I wouldn't has state called the center of the art world because I think there's lots of centers, but it is definitely a vortex there. So that was my criteria. Very good. Uh, Evan Lilly on Patreon again says, what moments in an artist's career require the most personal courage or risk-taking according to your own and that of your contemporaries? Um, well, I can't answer that of my contemporaries. Um, I would be very curious <laughs> to hear, but um, for me, I think there's been lots of little moments of it, uh, but for me, the biggest one has been the recent one, um, the recent shift in my work, because I think once you get a level of exposure where people know your work and they expect something of you um, and they love something that you do, and that feels really good. It feels really good to be appreciated for what you do. And so it, it was taking that risk to do something totally different that I knew that some people wouldn't like, but knowing that I had to do it anyways, that, yeah, that's, I think the biggest, the biggest for me. And I imagine for others as well as once, once you get a certain level of exposure and success, um, changing it when you need to just uh, like following your own internal compass and like knowing that you need to still be an artist and, and not just, um, I don't know, an artist in the, in the sense of kind of your core values of, of who you are and what you want to make versus an artist with sort of quotation marks, um, kind of as the world expects you to be. Yeah. 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 Very good. Uh, Francesca Frue on Instagram again says, usually artists are recognized for one specific type of painting or one specific type of subjects. So could an artist be successful uh, in today's art world, even if his or her art changes all the time? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I think that it's important to have a thread of your work. And I think that it also matters when you're doing this like there's there's going to be I, th I think as an artist you can make as many bodies of work as you want um thinking of them as bodies of work is important um but likely you know what galleries are going to be looking for is some consistency and people want to be able to recognize so I think that it, it does matter that you have a consistency but it doesn't mean that you can never change it and it doesn't mean you can't have different bodies of work but I think having some thread that 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 makes your work recognizable is part of it for sure as, as much as I wish it it wasn't um I think that it's I think that it is part of it yeah yeah um the whole gallery thing comes up uh, regularly on the podcast um from the outside it looks like you've have a lovely relationship with your gallery it, you're just with the one this flowers gallery in New York isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. So I've been with Flowers Gallery since 2012. Yeah. Um, 2012, 2013. Um, and I, they're, they're in New York, London, and Hong Kong. So that helps because they're everywhere. Not everywhere, but they've you know, have these, <laughs> these various places. Um, and they're, yeah, they're really wonderful. I, I, I wouldn't have stayed with them if I didn't, um, have a good relationship with them. And what I love about them is that they support, encourage me to paint whatever I want to paint. Uh, they just trust me, which is really great. Um, I remember when I was finishing up my first solo show with them, I had like two or three months to do it. It was very short. I mean, I already had work, but, um, and I was asking Matthew Flowers, he was in my studio 
And I was asking him, what, what do you think I should do to finish out the show? Like what painting should, you know, what should I do? Um, and he was like, Aaliyah, I'm never going to tell you what to paint. And that I really appreciated that. Um, and they've stuck to their word. So yeah, they, they support me and trust me, which is really important. Yeah. And I'm guessing that when you made the big shift recently, that they were just, w w was there any hesitation or were they just right in behind it? I mean, there may have been hesitation, but I didn't, they didn't say it directly to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I waited until I had three paintings finished um, until I, to, to show them, but I told them like my work is changing. Um, it's a big change. So they, they knew that a big change was happening. And then I waited to have, to be able to really show them something. I waited till I felt kind of clear in it before I showed them. Um, but then, yeah, they gave me a show and it's the work is up in Hong Kong right now. So um, yeah, they, they are, they're, they're behind it. <laughs> Very yeah. grateful for that. <laughs> Until the internal memos are declassified, which is yeah. going to go 100% like, <laughs> behind it. <laughs> exactly. Um, what sort of price range are your paintings selling for these days? Uh, it depends on the scale. Um, I think small ones could be like $2,000 US dollars to um, the large ones, 60, 70,000, 60. Yeah. So a big, pretty big range. Yeah. So that triptych must have been, how much was the triptych? Um, our shouts were drowned in the stars. Yes. This half a wall of a painting. <laughs> yeah. So I took big. up the whole, my whole studio. I, I, it's 18 feet long and my studio is 19 feet long. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> that one so has a much, great part of a big How much collection. was that? I mean, that was probably the 60 or 70, but I can't remember exactly. And then there's also discounts. So I can't remember what it actually sold for. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I thought you were going to say 180 or something because it was like three big paintings. <laughs> yeah, it may have been, it may have been more, but I can't remember. Um, I know I should remember that, but I'm just so grateful that the gallery deals with the sales part. Um, yeah, it's hard. The money part is, is awkward. So <laughs> I'm very glad that they do that. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm conscious of time. We've gone through everybody's questions, but except for one, I have this question that I ask to everybody who comes on the podcast. If there's one thing you could pass on to future generations, what would it be? Oh. Hmm. Future generations of artists? No, it can be about anything. It doesn't okay. have to be about art. Um, oh my God, that is a really, that's a big question. Um, I think, I think that it all, I think I would want to pass on that. I, I believe that it, everything starts within us, um, internally. So I think a relationship with your, with yourself, your internal self is extremely important. And I think I want to pass that on because I think that that has ripple effects in the whole world. Um, positive and negative. So I really hope that that, that we can all have that. And I, I do feel like that's actually something that, that COVID has done, hasn't been easy, but I think that it's, it has kind of forced us all to get to know ourselves a little bit better. And that's been really hard <laughs> at times, um, but I think it's really important. And yeah, so I hope that that continues and strengthens with all the future generations. Very good. Okay, now where can people find you on the internet? Uh, Instagram, um, Aaliyah underscore Chapin, um, all lowercase. And yeah, just mainly really just Instagram. Oh, my, my website, aaliyahchapin.com. Um, definitely, uh, but I, I, I post mostly just on Instagram. That's where you're gonna get the most up-to-date, up-to-date okay. everything. I have a Twitter, but it's just attached to my Instagram. So I'm not really ever on there and Facebook. Yeah, I saw that. I, I was like, wow, Twitter. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just sometimes I make, I make the Instagram posts go to Twitter. Yeah. I try to keep yeah, that all yeah. as simple as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Um, I am conscious of your time. Um, I, I really like your paintings. I didn't always like them. I have to say that's, a I found them hard going in the beginning. You know, like um, 
say, before the change, you know, it's funny the way it kind of happened for me. This is all about me. It's nothing to do with you. <laughs> um, before the change, I found the um, the lack of idealization. Now, I can sort of say this in hindsight, but I couldn't really put it in words there. I found it too hard. You know, it's like why I don't like watching, you know, if I'm watching a movie, if, I, if I'm looking at the description of a movie and it says gritty realism, I'm like, okay, that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I'm Ken Loach. No, 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 I'm fine. Thanks. You know? Um, so it was kind of in that, uh, area where I would, I would kind of look at them and go, yeah, no, that's too hard for me. That's too harsh for me. I want something that's more, um, I'd like my beauty prepared a little bit more for me. <laughs> it's almost like saying, can I have my food a little bit pre-chewed? <laughs> <laughs> and when I saw your work changing, my initial thing was like, oh, okay, this is great. This is now this I can get into. This is accessible oh. for me. <clears throat> um, I couldn't put my finger on it why it was. But then from spending time with your current work it's actually allowed me to access your earlier work in a different way wow and yeah and now i can kind of i now i kind of get it you know because i had um james guppy on the podcast years ago he's an australian artist mm -hmm. i don't know if you know him do you know him i not not personally but i know his work yeah. You know his work, okay. So you know that series he did of women who are sort of middle-aged and a bit older. I think he called mm -hmm. them something fairies. There's this, kind of, there's this kind of similarity there where he was basically listening to his wife's, his wife's friends talking about their experience um, of being that age. And they were sort of saying that they, were, they felt like they were invisible. But, and he, he was trying to capture what, what, he, what it looked like to him was going on for them. Um, they're great paintings. Um, it's almost like you, your previous work, I'm sort of seeing it in that way now. There's a sort of, um, I can actually get the beauty now. I couldn't get it before. And that was a sort of, a, I don't know, a lack of vision on my part, or I just wasn't, I hadn't got there yet. But so, something about the new work um allowed me to be able to see the older work differently and it all seems like a continuity now and um yeah i think that's really powerful it sort of feels powerful to me like that just that it had that effect on me ah, <laughs> that in, in a way it pardon i i love hearing that i i, I appreciate that you actually um responded to my newer work more and that's what I want right now because that's that's the work I'm responding to more and that it actually it's really fascinating to me that it led you to see my older work in a, in a new way I think that's yeah really cool yeah thank you yeah that's remarkable I think I think that yeah. sort of um I think that sort of highlights your you know genius as it comes through you uh, as an artist that you know, it's not like the your earlier work changed, but the you know the progression of that expression of genius coming through allowed you know had that effect on me and was able to allow me to see your earlier work differently. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's totally amazing. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. I yeah, I'm I'm curious if that has happened with other people too, because um, yeah, I'm just yeah. thank you. That's all. Awesome. Yeah, so there's that, which is, you know, fantastic. Technically, of course, you're, you know, amazing. I really like your heavy kind of rock paintings, landscape paintings as well. I really like the, um, the you know, the the ones of the sort of forest floor kind of with all that. That's something really, uh, normally, I have to say, landscapes don't do much for me. They're kind of like, yeah, they're nice, but where's the people? That's kind of the way I am a little bit. But, uh, you. <laughs> but <laughs> yours are, um, yeah, there's something about the about them that is um, you managed to get a sort of the same kind of interest 
that a figure would have for me into your landscapes, which again is pretty amazing. Um, well, I see them as it? portraits. I see them as portraits of landscapes or por those those forest floor ones you're talking about. Those are usually my 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 backyard, my garden, and I yeah. see that I call them por portraits of my garden. Um, so I, I I I look at them in the same way that I am with a and I treat them the same way that I'm treating, treating a, a person. So maybe that's why, but I, I love hearing that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I'm like, I'm just kind of add my voice to everyone else's uh, admiring your courage because we talked about Picasso, but he didn't have social media. All he had to deal with one guy <laughs> he had to deal with in his gallery. That's it. You know? And if that guy was on board, it was like, great. Yeah. You go off and do that. Picasso. That's fine. Whereas, you know, in, in, in like the modern the world what the art world that we live in now it is a bit of a goldfish bowl you know like you're everyone you're at the mercy of you know a lot of people who could just say whatever the hell they want you know so i think it requires more courage now particularly if you're engaged in that which you are uh, to listen to your heart and follow it you know I think that's mm. that's that's very inspiring, uh, really, to do that. Thank um, you so much. You know, I, I add to that. I actually, um, I see how it's more challenging because of social media and that kind of fishbowl effect. But I have to also say, back then when Picasso was changing his work, nothing had ever been done that way. And for now, we kind of have the opposite, where it's like everything has sort of been done. Like every language of paint. Like I'm not breaking new boundaries with ways of painting i'm just mm. I, I i'm maybe new, doing a new combination or a new you know synthesis of it but he was breaking bound i mean like he was breaking boundaries of of way of ways that people painted and people hated him i mean i actually used to hate him too so i get it but um <laughs> you know so i think that there's definitely challenges that that he had that I don't have just because everything has been done but then also now the fact that everything sort of I mean I know it hasn't all been done but it kind of there's so much that has been done the 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 way that painting can be the you know the definition of art is so expanded yes um, that, that makes it both easy and extremely challenging yeah yeah well I was going to say that about your new work that I've seen other artists attempt to do what you've done in the new work uh, mm -hmm. unsuccessfully mm -hmm. and you pull it off very well uh, it's not a it's a very hard thing to do I think what you've done um, because you do manage to combine this raw elemental freedom with mm -hmm. um, beautifully rendered classical bits <laughs> that's pretty much how it's <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, I was very much aware of the fact that I wasn't doing something new with this and I resisted it at the beginning because I didn't want to make a realist painting with some cool loose stuff over it. Um, cause I feel like that had been done and I, I probably did that in school. Um, but I, for, for me, the goal was to make it all intentional while still leaving room for exploration and accidents and discovery. But um, to have it have a purpose. It wasn't there just to be cool. Um, yeah. And also to have it be based from the drawings, from the loose stuff. It wasn't a realist yeah. painting with a cool thing on top. It was the, they, they started, the painting started from these very raw, very real, very in, in, like intentionally um, intuitive drawings. They, start, they started there and then I, I wanted to make sure with the paintings that I started in that place too, which is why the paintings start with the loose and they 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 begin with that and everything else is built up around them. And I, I think maybe that's part of why they're they're working. Um, that's why they're working for me because I think that if I tried it a different way, they wouldn't work for me because they would kind of feel cheesy or something. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah, about the intentionality. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think you've managed to capture the vitality of just being and i think mm. that's the link back to for me anyway is the link back to your previous work and the probably the, the thing i wasn't seeing um was that uh you know there's 
the the vitality in your current work is exactly the same as the vitality in your earlier work because you you know you're just expressing being in different ways like in the earlier work it was more your external reflection on what it, you know what you were seeing as the beingness in others and then the, the newer work is more you know what looks like your experience of being the internal experience of it exactly that was beautifully said yeah i feel like you've totally got it great yeah. okay let's quit while we're ahead <laughs> <laughs> so i keep in touch with everybody um you know for zoom tea and whatnot so i'm sure we'll keep in touch but yeah we'll say goodbye for now yeah thank you so much john this has been really really fun and thank you everyone for the questions and the support on social media and the kind words you're all really amazing thank you thank you so much um okay well as i say we'll keep in touch but bye for now bye john thank you so much i've never felt this good in my entire life make me some spaghetti actually i'd prefer a cup of tea <laughs> a cup of tea would be lovely so yeah just a little reminder mainly because every second or third person who becomes a patron has got in touch with me and said you know what i've been listening to your podcast for ages and I didn't become a patron, not because I don't have the money, not because I don't think it's great. I just didn't get around to it. So this is a little friendly reminder that if you'd like to be a patron, you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, go to patreon.com forward slash John Dalton. Gently does it all one word or follow the link in the show notes to become a patron i would really appreciate it if you could do that particularly if you've been meaning to and you just haven't got around to it it would be great it would mean a lot to me all right thank you bye we are the argal pimps so buy us a drink we're better than you thought but not as good as we think we are the argal pimps so buy us a drink come on buy us a drink come on buy us a drink we are the argal pimps so buy us a drink we're better than you thought but not as good as we think we are the argal